How much oil can be carried by a pipeline network? How many cars can fit on the road network? How many trips can the tube network handle? These are all questions about graphs. But what's especially interesting about them is that there are two graphs involved. There's the infrastructure graph, which says where the pipes are, or roads, or tracks, and there's a separate usage graph, which says how much each piece of the infrastructure is actually being used. In this video and the next, we're going to look at an algorithm for answering questions of this sort. But first, to make it into a proper algorithmic problem, we need to formalize it. Here's a stylized version of the question. Imagine we have a directed graph and each edge is labeled with a weight, which we'll call capacity. Think of the edges as pipes. Also, let's imagine that there are two special vertices, the source and the sink. And there's a flow of stuff coming in at the source and we want to pipe it to the sink through our pipe network. We'll imagine that there's an unlimited amount of stuff available at the source and the only limit is the capacity of our pipe network. And the question is, how should we pump it through to the sink? Well, let's start. We could send the flow down this first pipe, the STU pipe. The pipe has capacity 12, so let's try to send as much as we can. It doesn't matter what the units are, just think of them as litres per second or vehicles per hour or whatever you like. So there's 12 units coming into U and it has to get piped out of U. Where should we send it to? Well, we have a choice about how to split this flow between the two edges going out of U. Let's say for the sake of argument, we send three units towards V and then onto T, and we send the remaining nine units on the direct U to T pipe. So we're sending a total flow of 12 liters per second. There's 12 coming in at the source, and there must be 12 being tapped out at the sink. Could we pump any more from the source to the sink? But we can fit more on the S to V pipe. Let's try to send three more units that way. Now there's an excess at V, what do we do with it? We could send some to T using the pipe, which isn't yet at full capacity, but we can't do anything with the remainder. Let's route it back to S. Okay, so the net flow we're sending out of the source is now 13 units of flow, the original 12 plus one more. We're piping three units along the S to V pipe, but two of them are just going round and round in a loop. They're not extra flow being pumped in at the source. It's easier to see at the sink, there's a net flow of 13 units coming into the sink, and so the net flow coming out of the source must be the same, 12 plus three minus two, which is 13. In the version of the problem that we'll be studying, we only care about the total amount that's flowing from the source to the sink. We won't bother about keeping track of which bits are going where at each vertex. All we care about is the flow amount on each of the edges. Okay, so now we can state our problem. Given a graph in which each edge has a capacity, how much flow should we assign to each edge so as to maximize the net flow from source to sink, which is known as the flow value? Have a look at this graph and see if you can find a way to adjust the flows to get a higher flow value. At first glance, it looks like we're stuck. We're using up all the capacity on both the outgoing pipes from the source. So how could we possibly fit more? But if you think a bit harder, you'll spot a way to increase the flow value. Pause the video and try to answer two questions. First, how can you adjust the flows shown here to get a higher flow value? And second, what's the maximum possible flow value that's achievable on this network? If you can answer both of these questions, then you'll have grasped the big ideas behind the next two videos. So pause the video and have a think before you proceed. In the next two videos, we're going to study an algorithm for answering these two questions. 
But before that, I want to describe two applications, partly because it's just interesting to see the historical context of flow problems like this, and partly because the relationship between those two applications will turn out to tell us a lot about why our algorithm works. First, a problem from the Soviet Union in the 1930s. Here's a map of part of the Soviet Union. You can see Novosibirsk at the top right and Tashkent in the bottom middle. Each of the vertices on this diagram is a railway station and the edges between stations each have a certain capacity measured in tons per day. Some of the stations are associated with sources, i.e. places where the cargo is produced. I think it was cement that was being considered in this paper. And some of the stations are associated with sinks, i.e. places that need cement delivered to them. This isn't quite the same as our formal problem statement. In our statement, we suppose there was just one source and just one sink. But the problem in this 1930s paper, there are actually 10 sources and 68 sinks and 155 edges, which makes it a pretty demanding problem to solve without computers. There's actually a simple way to translate this Soviet cement flow problem into a single source, single sink problem. And we'll talk more about this sort of problem translation in a later video. Okay, so this is the first example of a flow problem stated in 1930 and solved by hand without the aid of computers. And in fact, solved using heuristic methods because the algorithm wasn't actually discovered until 1956. Okay, on to another application. This is in fact another application to the Soviet rail network, but from a very different perspective. This diagram is from a study produced by the Rand Corporation in 1955. The Rand Corporation is a think tank that does consultancy work for the United States military. And during the Cold War, it was a centerpiece of the US military industrial complex. This was the heyday of cybernetics and central planning. And in fact, Bellman and Ford both of whom we've already come across, worked at RAND. Anyway, this piece of work was commissioned by the US Air Force. And before proceeding, I should let you know this is a classified document not to be divulged under US espionage laws, although in fact this was declassified in 1995, so we're safe. Anyway, this piece of work was planning for a potential Soviet invasion of Western Europe. If you want to mount a land invasion of Western Europe, the geography of mountain ranges means that the only practical route is through East Germany, marked EG on the left-hand side of this map. And in order to mount a land invasion, you need to get lots of fuel from all your refineries. These are marked origins on the right-hand side of the map, and you'll transport your fuel across the railway network. Again, this map shows a section of the Soviet Union's rail network at the time, and each edge has been annotated with its capacity measured in trains per day. So there are two obvious questions to ask. First question, what's the maximum possible rate at which the Soviet Union could ship fuel into East Germany, given the capacity of the rail network? And second, if the US Air Force wanted to bomb the network to reduce capacity, which links should it bomb? There are some links where it's useless bombing because you could just reroute around the damage. So assuming that the Soviet Union is sending as much through its network as it possibly can, what are the links that the US Air Force ought to bomb, the ones where there's no way for it to reroute the flow? In other words, the bottleneck. That's what's marked on the map here. And the idea of a bottleneck will turn out to be the crucial idea in the proof of correctness in the algorithm that we're going to look at in the next video.